Um, uh, good afternoon, I'm Fred Kemp, I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here at the Atlantic Council today on behalf of everyone at the Atlantic Council, on behalf of Annie Piparinen who's pulled all this together, so a salute to you for everything you're doing in our Cyber Statecraft Initiative, Annie, for, uh, for the launch of this crucially important report. And, you know, people standing at podiums say things like crucially important. It really is. <laughs> uh, hacking the election, lessons from the DEF CON voting village. Uh, here at the Atlantic Council, we uh, operate under the enduring mission of working together to secure the future. This is meant seriously here because the founders of the Atlantic Council were there at the creation. In fact, one of the people who helped found us was Dean Acheson, who wrote the book there at the creation of the International Liberal Order. Uh, we see that order as being under threat, and we see one of the things that's most under threat in the order we created is the advance and the protection and the security of democracies. We believe a stable, prosperous world depends on building and sustaining democracy, and democracy depends on the sanctity of the vote. In recent years, this fundamental core to our system of government has come under threat. Unprecedented assaults in the United States and Europe are bringing scrutiny and uncertainty to once inviable electoral processes. We at the Atlantic Council have been doing quite a bit of work in countering disinformation, both within our Eurasia Center and in our digital forensic research lab, some really cutting edge work. We haven't done yet work in this area, so it's a particular pleasure and honor to be associated uh, with this event and the work behind it. In the current geopolitical climate, preserving or in some cases reinstating public faith in the integrity and security of our elections is more crucial than ever before. This can only be achieved if we're able to protect the technologies, to protect the technologies underpinning our democracy. While much of the discussion over the past 12 months has focused on the Russian linked information operations with carefully timed leaks, fake news, Facebook ads most recently, recent revelations have made clear how vulnerable the very technologies we use to manage our records, cast our votes, and tally our results really are, and that's new. We now have alarming evidence of Russian-connected hackers successfully breaching electronic poll books and state and local voter data databases in at least 21 states across the United States, uh, this recently released by the Dep Department of Homeland Security. And you have to understand how careful DHS is before it puts out this kind of information. The technical community, including many Atlantic Council experts, have attempted to raise alarm about these threats uh, for some years. This summer, the experts on today's panel and others concerned about the safety of the vote teamed up with the world's larger, largest hacker conference, DEF CON, to host the first ever, and I underline this, first ever voting machine hacking village. Um, this determined group invited security researchers to probe two dozen electronic voting machines, many of which are still in use today. The hackers were able to break into and gain remote control of the machines in a matter of minutes. These findings from the voting village are incredibly disconcerting. We at the Atlantic Council applaud the groundbreaking and tireless work of the organizers to shed light on these threats and this unsettling 
reality. Uh, we believe that transparency is about 80 percent of what uh, is needed here because you have to actually understand and know the threat in order to get the targets and others to take care of uh, defending themselves. This is not simply a cybersecurity issue, but one of the most pressing national security concerns uh, uh, eating at the bedrock of our democracy. The Council's own cyber team is proud to have supported this critical effort by taking Representatives James Langevin and Will Hurd to Las Vegas this July, the first sitting congressman to ever attend the conference and witness firsthand its voting village. We're honored to continue this partnership by convening today's discussion, and we look forward to assisting in the next steps of this crucially important effort. Uh, you may have read in USA Today that a group is coming together to try to uh, continue to work and continue to work around this, and we're proud to be part of that. Before I turn it over to Jeff Moss for his remarks, let me take uh, a moment uh, to introduce our panelists. Uh, Jeff is the founder of uh, two of the most influential information security uh, conferences in the world, DEF CON and Black Hat and he's a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Cyber Statecraft Initiative in our Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security. Uh, Ambassador Douglas Lute uh, is the former U.S. Uh, permanent representative to NATO uh, and uh, serving under President Obama from 2013 to 2017. Prior to this and after retiring from active duty as Lieutenant General after 35 years of service, he served as the assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor under President Bush, as well as President Obama. Um, uh, we have a bipartisan ethos. Uh, you've worked in a real hands-on bipartisan manner. John Gilligan is the Chairman of the Board at the Center for the Internet Security. He served as President of the Schaefer Corporation, Senior Vice President at SRA International, and Chief Information Officer at the U.S. Air Force and Department of Energy. Um, uh, Sherry Ramsey is senior advisor uh, to the CEO at CyberPoint International, engaged in strategy development and planning. She's the former director of the NSA, uh, NSA CSS Threat Operations Center. That's a, uh, that's a pretty big job and pretty uh, significant position where she led discovery and characterization of threats to national security systems. Uh, Harry Hursty is the founding partner of Nordic Innovation Labs and one of the organi organizers of the DEF CON Voting Village. He has fascinating insights. I've just heard a little bit in, uh, outside this room uh, on this problem that we're talking about today. He's one of the world's leading authorities in the areas of election voting security and critical infrastructure security. And as an ethical hacker, famously demonstrated how certain voting machines could be hacked, ultimately altering voting results. Our moderator today is uh, Jake Brown. Uh, Jake is a, a lecturer at the University of Chicago and C CEO of Cambridge Global Advisors uh, and co-organizer of the DEF CON Voting Village. Jake also serves as strategic advisor on cybersecurity to the Department of Homeland Security in the Pentagon. So this is a heavyweight group and we're all looking forward to your uh, reflections. Uh, huge thanks for all of, uh, of you joining us today and joining us online, and thank you for everything you contribute to this work. Lastly, I encourage everyone in the audience or watching online to take, place, to take part in the conversation by following at AC Scowcroft and at Voting Village DC, and by using the hashtag, hashtag AC, sorry, Hashtag AC Cyber. So there's actually two C's there. So hashtag AC Cyber. And, and now, without further delay, uh, uh, let me turn the podium over to Jeff. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to just start with a little bit of a story to give you some context on on how we got here, um, and then just a couple of thoughts on where I think we're going. Uh, for those of you uh, curious, ha we've had electronic uh, voting machines for a long time, and hackers have been talking about them for a long time. I think Harry's been poking at them for 14 years. Uh, at DEF CON, we had one of our first speakers talk about this concept of black box voting machines more than 10, 12 years ago. Um, so in the hacking world, it's not new, 
What's new, though, uh, is the attention on them and the importance uh, that they're now playing in our democracy. So, so how did we get here? I want to blame this guy, <laughs> Jake. Blame him. Um, Jake was this uh, national security uh, coordinator between the White House and DHS back when I first started um, at the Homeland Security Advisory Council. And so I got to know Jake, and he was really passionate about voter protection uh, when he was involved in the Obama uh, campaign. And so maybe last year we're talking, and, and Jake, still with his voter protection hat on, is saying, you know, I bet these machines are just, there's, there's got to be problems with these machines, right? It's like, oh yeah, there's, there's definitely problems with these machines. Um, I just don't know what they are, but I can tell you there's got to be problems. So I start looking online, and I look for reports, and I look for studies, and I look for you know security analysts tearing these machines apart, and you can't find any. You can find an Everest report from 2008. You can find some very controlled uh, reports where the manufacturers got the researchers to sign NDAs and do very limited testing over a couple of days. But for a hacker, like that doesn't count. Like I want to see the pictures. I want to see like the trials and tribulations of the people attacking these machines. And so I told them I, I couldn't really find anything, but I'm sure they're just a disaster. Um, and then maybe a couple more weeks went by, and then he said, you know what, you should just just get a bunch of hackers to tear these things apart. It's like, well, that's a great idea. Um, but we're not going to be able to get any of these from the manufacturers. They're so tightly controlled. There's purchase, sale agreements. Um, you just, you're not going to get these machines or the software. And, but I started looking on eBay. And sure enough, thank you, eBay, there are some to be found. Right? I mean, we have two here that Harry's going to hack into later. Um, and uh, so sure enough, OK, we could get our hands on some machines. And they're not that expensive, because these things never get updated. They've been around for like a decade. Um, so you can get these things fairly inexpensively. Uh, and then this, and so I allocated some space. Um, we got the, we got some people together. We started ordering machines, and then I realized I'm not a voting machine expert. I can tell you about generalized security problems. I can tell you historically what kind of systems have had issues, but I can't tell you the ins and outs specifically. So my friend Harry, Matt Blaze, uh, Sandy Clark, and some others who have spent more than a decade looking at these uh, said, OK, well, you get the machines, and you get us the space, and we'll run the village. And it was really fascinating, because if you're not familiar with DEF CON, we have about 25,000 people uh, that show up. And they, that divides into many different topic areas. But as soon as we announced the voting village, I got state, local, county election officials contacting me, desperate for information. Like, I have these machines, and I have no idea what they do. I have these machines, and I don't know if I can trust any of the documentation. Tell me, you know, tell me what you find. And so we would try to get them to come out, and they're like, I have no budget. I can't travel. Can you just live stream people attacking the machines? <laughs> it's like, I don't know how much that's going to help you, but we'll write this report, and this will hopefully help you. Um, so this report is a culmination of a lot of things. One, it is the first step in trying to change the narrative. Um, as you'll read, um, these machines were pretty uh, easy to, to hack. And this flies in the face of the narrative that's been spun by the manufacturers, which is you have to be an insider. You have to have specific knowledge of the technology. Random people aren't going to be able to uh, just approach these machines and hack them. They're going to need to spend some time to study them and understand the context. Um, and I think uh, we opened the doors, and 35 minutes later, one of the machines fell. It turns out that. Hacking technology is pretty much hacking technology. And if you look at the history of DEF CON, we've hacked automobiles, implantable medical devices, airplanes, physical locks, access control systems, Internet of Things devices, adult toys, um, ATM machines. So chances are, yes, we're going to be able to hack your 10-year-old election machine. The difference now is that it counts. Now people are paying attention. They weren't paying attention 10 years ago. And so the other thing is, <clears throat> now it's not a conversation, I think, between us and the state and local uh, officials. I think this really needs to be more of a discussion uh, at a higher, more national security 
level. And I was struck by something um, Ambassador Lute said, which was essentially there's two ways to change uh, a government, the, the bullet box or the ballot box. And I, I thought about that for a while, and we spend a lot of money on the bullet box. We have nuclear triads, we have oversight, we have testing ranges, we have a large amount of money and technology invested in the bullet box. How much do we have in the ballot box? Pretty much nothing. It was only just recently uh, classified as critical infrastructure. So they're both, I believe, equally important, but all of our energy is in the more exciting bullet box. And I think part of what we're going to say here is it really needs to also be the ballot box because this problem is not going away. It's only going to accelerate. Um, so three things made this possible. The first, we have a three-year DMCA exception. Normally, you wouldn't be able to reverse engineer these things for copyright violations. And the manufacturers aggressively use DMCA takedown notices to prevent researchers from publishing results or looking at these machines. There was a three-year exception. This last year was year two. Next year is year three. If we can get that <laughs> exemption renewed or in permanent position, researchers will just be able to take apart this technology and really provide an independent view of what's going on here. That was not ever possible before. And so once we removed sort of the fear of litigation and we lined up an impressive array of lawyers waiting to defend us if anything happened, um, we felt pretty confident going to the uh, conference that if, if anybody was going to sue us, we were going to have enough resources to defend ourselves. And this time, with the DMCA uh, out of the way, we would be able to defend ourselves. The second one was a giant storm that collapsed the roof of a building where a county was storing all their voting machines. And the insurance company totaled out all the equipment in the, in the facility, including the voting machines. And the insurance company owned the voting machines now. There's no purchase and sale agreement. There's no sort of NDA covering this equipment. The insurance company didn't want it. They gave it away to a recycler, an electronics recycler, who then, now they have the equipment with no NDA and no purchase agreement signed. So now, if we get our hands on these machines, we can do whatever we want. We're not violating any rules, any uh, civil law. Um, well, the manufacturer contacted them and said, hey, can you uh, please disassemble all the machines? Uh, and you know, basically take them out of commission. And uh, he said, sure, uh, how much do you want to pay me per machine? So well, we want to pay you zero. It's like, well, would you like to buy all the machines back? Well, no. It's like, it's okay, well, this is my number, call me back anytime you're willing to you know, change your mind. And he just started selling them on eBay. And ladies and gentlemen, the TSX voting machine. Um, <laughs> and last, the final ingredient was that we have this culture of hacking things and exploring and publishing results. And so it was these three things, uh, upcoming DEF CON, the storm, and the DMCA made this possible for the first time. Um, and really, that's totally unacceptable. <coughs> We've been using these machines for more than a decade, and this is the first time we get to actually look under the hood? That doesn't make any sense as a country. Like something is wrong there from a policy standpoint, and we need to really understand what's going on and how do we fix that. Because we can't run our country like this. When's the next storm going to happen, right? So I really want us to think about that. And that said, I'd like to hand it over to Jake, who's going to go into a moderated Q&A session. And then when we're done, we're going to go to the audience and a answer any questions you may have. All right. Thank you very much. I'm just going to sit for the Q&A. <laughs> um, so first off, Hari, um, you, uh, you and, and Professor Blaze um, were the kind of technical leads running uh, the Hacking Village, uh, vote, vote Hacking Village. So tell us, uh, what did you find? Well, first of all, it was well established that every machine we had is hackable. That was not one thing we, we tried to establish. That was already done. Instead, this was a learning experience where people can first time sink their teeth into the machines, find the truth themselves. One thing what really delighted me was how many election officials came in and hacked the machine they used to run elections. They really came, can I trust? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, the other thing was the speed. 
a lot of time when we have been doing, and one of the people who have been doing uh, these uh, Secretary of State uh, Commission studies, one reputal has been, well, of course, if you have few weeks, you can hack it. First of all, if a nation state will attack, they probably have few weeks too. <laughs> uh, they don't wake up in a, in a hangover and say, oh, oh, they have an election, let's do that now. Yeah, they have time. But the, as mentioned, DMCA and other regulation and NDAs and rules of the of scope of work, rules of work, those are the things why it took long time. Right now, as said, we, we have less than half an hour when the first machine had, we opened the doors at 10, at 11, already one team came to me. 11 was the, supposed to be the introductory speech. Um, <laughs> at the time, first machine had already fell. And at the time, the guy who did that, Karsten, he said, well, I, I said, can you, can you show it? Can you make a proof of concept? And he said, no, I, I need to go to, I want to listen to this speech, but I will come back. And he went to have, had a, listened to the speech for 45 minutes, came back and wrote a proof of concept. At the same time, uh, he was from Denmark, so, non-US, um, at the same time, during the speech, another team who was from Northern California hacked the EPOL book. So at the time when the introductory speech was over, already two machines have felt. <laughs> uh, this technology is very old. And for a lot of people who were there, they were not even you know, born when a lot of these chips were convened, uh, conceived. So one of the things were immediately a, people were calling in a Twitter asking for a tools in order to do, because they were unprepared. And a lot of the current tools actually are not backwards compatible that much behind. This tool, for example, became to be one of the saving of the day. Costs $15 made in New York. But this is enabling you to be compatible with the very old technology. Some of the findings, and I would just, you know, there's so many things, but I want to highlight uh, one thing, which is we found vulnerabilities which have not been studied before because of the rules of the road of the previous studies. And those vulnerabilities put a unreasonable stress to not today non-existing chain of custody. A device can be hacked any time during its life, and once you have hacked it, it's a persistent attack and you cannot clean it. And this also comes to the supply chain. We found a components made all around the world, assemblies made in all around the world, anything from China, mainland China, Taiwan, Philippines, Israel, you name it, there's components, there's elements, and we don't even know the extension of that host country. What is the extension they have participated in the design and building of this? So it's the chain of custody while it's, when it's already in US and put in use, but it's a supply chain how that device came to be, where it came from, how you make sure then that the machine you get is clean to start with. So those are just my opening remarks. Um, thank you. So Sherry, after spending a long time at NSA, um, what, what are your thoughts on, on the, the relevance of, especially the supply chain side of this, but, but also any of the other findings that they had? Okay, well, to follow on with Harry's comments and the comments that Jeff and you have made, um, the first thing you want to do when you kind of look at this problem is figure out, you know, what's the target? Is it something that people would be interested in? And then how can, what is the concept for how that target can legitimately be hacked or accessed? You know, would it take a year? Would it take, you know, 5,000 people to do this? Is this something that we really should worry about? Or is this kind of something that, yeah, it could be done, but not likely to be done? And so, and then the last thing we need to, to talk about is, would anybody be interested in doing it? Um, you know, there can be all kinds of vulnerabilities out there, but if no one's really interested, then maybe we don't spend money and we don't spend time and effort worrying about this. So let's kind of quickly answer those three questions when we're talking about this. So obviously the specific target, um, well, the target might be the U.S. democracy, but if you look at the focus target, it would be the voting machines themselves. And so if you, if you look at the companies, um, not that many years ago, there were 19, 20 more companies worldwide who, made, who were recognized as making voting machines and you know, who were big in that space and people would buy the voting machines from them. Well, in the last few years, um, just by you know, a natural progression of economy and things that have happened on the global scale, companies have merged, companies have gone out of business. Today, there's really only three or four big, well-known, recognized companies that, that build these voting machines that we would be interested in, in purchasing and using for our elections. 
So just by that virtue, we have really focused the target set. Um, it's no longer hundreds or even tens, it's three or four. And so that was a very specific limited target set that, that an adversary would, would need to go after. The second thing is to, you know, let's kind of look at how could this be done? Is there a realistic way to do that? Well, you know, if you look at the voting machines as well as, in fact, look at our laptops, look at your cell phones that many of you are using now, watches on our arms, children's toys, our refrigerator. What are all missiles, airplanes, we go on. In fact, you talked about a lot of them that have already been at DEF CON. What do they all have in common? Well, they all have in common, they're built of hardware, chips like this one here, and they run with software. And you know what, and, and I think as you both mentioned, um, in a lot of ways, it, it's not even specific to the voting machine. It's hardware and it's software. And there's chips that are manufactured globally because of the global economy. And we don't know where all the chips come from. Um, in fact, not many of them come from the US. They come, most of them come from outside of the US, primarily for cost purposes. Um, so there is kind of this natural approach. It's to hack the software, which has been done for years. Mm -hmm. But even more so, um, hackers are starting to look at hardware for a number of reasons. Um, a couple of them are um, hardware hacks can be more persistent. If you do a software upgrade, the, the malware will, the, the firmware will stick through that. And also, oftentimes, um, we think things are not connected to the internet. Oftentimes, when we think they're not, they, they really are, by the way. But in, in the, on the off chance, they're really not, and somebody wanted to um, get into this device and perhaps take data away from it, exfiltrate data, they have to find a way to get it out. So if they do a hard, kind of hardware hack, a hardware implant, change the firmware, change a chip, now they've also just created a path for them to put the data out. And, um, and, and I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. So because of the global marketplace, because the voting machines as well as many, many other things, maybe everything, is made of just hardware and software, the concept for how to do this is actually pretty well known and, and relatively easy as we've seen. So this kind of, cr we've created this opportunity. And so now who would wanna do this? And who has the capability to do this? Well, you know, we, we can look at a number of nation states who have been actually trying to influence the U.S. elections for years. They've just been doing it in other ways. Now we've given them this way to, to particularly do that. But perhaps there's other elements as well, criminal, criminals, terrorist groups. Many of them out there are generally accepted, I believe, by the community and the know uh, of having the wherewithal, that is the sophistication, the money, the wherewithal to actually pull this off. And so you say, okay, well, you know, still it's hard. How would they do that? They'd have to do it one voting machine at a time. You know, they're spread all over the country. Well, you know, not really. If you go back to that limited target set, they're coming from four different manufacturers. And really the supply chain is a great um, kind of infection vector for them to do that. And even within the supply chain, there's so many opportunities. It could be done with an insider just for money. They could really care less about the US. We just pay them off, change the firmware, change the chip process, change that software. So an insider could actually affect huge, huge numbers of chips and things which would go into the voting machines as well as, as other um, appliances as well. Also, if you think about it, um, it's just a software hack. You can go in and actually hack the infrastructure, the software development infrastructure of the companies that are developing software for the machines. And actually, at the very beginning, put the malware in so that when that software is downloaded on the machine, it already has the malware inside it. And these are things that, read the newspaper today, we're seeing this done every single day. And so as, you know, kind of the bottom line is, are the voting machines special? No, they're really not. They're hardware and software. And we've kind of demonstrated that, that this can happen. So I think this, this kind of, if you follow logically this scenario, it should give each one of us, it should cause us to pause and really be concerned about um, the elections and our processes and these voting machines of the future. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Gilligan, uh, as the entity that, that um, or the head of the entity that, that uh, helps enhance the cybersecurity of state and local governments, who are the ones that, that uh, administer our elections. Uh, what are we gonna do about this? Well, Jake, uh, 
My, my first thought would be that uh, as I listen to Harry and Jerry's presentation, there's, there's a tendency to get out the sharp knife to cut your wrist. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems like a an intractable problem. Here we go. Uh, the, the, what I'd like to do to maybe set the context was it was mentioned that I, I was Chief Information Officer of the Air Force uh, some time ago. And, and I'll, I'll tell a story that to me helps put in context what then we in the Center for Internet Security do. And that was NSA used to come in annually and do a penetration analysis of each of the services, Air Force being one, and then we'd get a debriefing. <coughs> I'm sure they're a lot better today, but back then my biggest fear was if anyone was sitting in that room who was from the outside, I would be fired immediately because NSA was very successful in penetrating our systems. And so I went to NSA and I said, this is not helpful. Um, I need to know where to start. And so NSA uh, came back after a, a month and a half and they said, you know, nobody had ever asked this question, but it was really helpful because we got our offensive teams and our defensive teams together and uh, they put together what they thought were, these are the areas that we see that are exploited or that we exploit. Now, I only paid attention to the first part of the briefing because they said 80% of the attacks have as an origin misconfigured software. Patch, uh, software that's not configured initially properly or hasn't been patched. That was 80%. I said, well, that's where I'm gonna start, and we did. Um, I give that story as a way of giving some context to the Center for Internet Security is focused on what we call best practices. And, and uh, configuring software and patching, knowing what's on your network, um, controlling administrative uh, privilege, auditing, et cetera, are all sort of what we call basic hygiene good, good practices. And they truly are effective, those types of practices, against the majority of the attacks. I mean, the, the, the philosophy being why do something sophisticated, some examples were given here, if you can just get on the net and go after the misconfigured software. Um, Equifax is a good example. Um, Equifax is a good example as well because the Apache strut software that was exploited is an open source software. It does not have uh, a supply chain um, issue and it is often embedded in other products as Sherry mentioned. And so this gets to be sort of a complex problem. So anyway, the Center for Internet Security focuses on best practices. Uh, we provide, um, we take commercial versions of products and we, uh, through a collaborative process, we define what should be the secure configuration. We disable those things that have high security risk. We enable <coughs> uh, controls that, that are gonna ensure that we have better security. And then we promulgate those. Um, uh, in addition, we have developed what we call the, the set of controls it's the, the, these basic hygiene activities. There happens to be 20 of them. And our view is if an organization focuses on these, they are addressing the most common threat patterns and they're gonna be significantly more secure. Uh, so our, our effort internally is, uh, is going to be to take the elections uh, ecosystem and to develop a set of best practices, a handbook for best practices for election systems. Now we're gonna do this following our normal process in sort of a collaborative manner. We have uh, you know, about four or 500 people currently who collaborate with us. We're gonna expand that horizon a bit because there are a number of those who have uh, specific expertise in election systems and we'll invite them. We're gonna invite obviously DHS and NIST. Uh, we're gonna invite the Elections Assistance Commission which has responsibility for actually focusing on the voting machines themselves. Uh, we're going to invite the National Association of Secretaries of State and other election officials to participate. And the view being, um, let's get together and very quickly, by the end of this calendar year, produce a set of best practices that then will be given to uh, the state and local governments. Our effort will complement what the Elections Assistance Commission is developing presently with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They are developing what's called the Voluntary voter systems, voting systems guidelines, version 2.0, which is an updated version trying to address a number of issues, including security. So that, that, that effort uh, we're gonna undertake immediately, uh, obviously based on the background of the organization, focusing on best practices, we got a pretty good handle on some foundational uh, efforts for this. 
and we're going to move forward. The other hat, as Jake mentioned, that we wear in the Center for Internet Security is under DHS uh, oversight uh, and funding, we provide security to state, local, tribal, and territory, tribal and territorial uh, organizations. So we have about 1,500 members. Uh, we provide um, education. We provide security monitoring, vulnerability assessments. We provide incident response uh, capabilities, alerts and warnings. Um, in addition, um, as part of our education campaign, we're going to increase our emphasis using this handbook on election systems in conjunction with our other best practices activities to try to see if we can't use the emphasis that we now have on election systems to improve security really across state, local, tribal, and territorial organizations. Fantastic. Um, Jeff, uh, can you tell us what are you guys planning for next year at DEF CON? Oh yeah, so version two. So next year is our last year under the DMCA. I don't know, Harry, when do we find out if it gets renewed? Uh, you know. The first application period is already over, so I'm not in top of my head knowing the schedule. Last year we had, uh, that was in May when we had the May last push. May. Okay, so we, we might know if it's going to be extended or not. So we'll, we'll be able to adjust what we do next year. But the idea is um, we want to get our hands on this. The part that's really hard to get our hands on is the back-end software that ties the voting machines together to tabulate, to accumulate votes, and to, to uh, provision a voting ballot, and to run the election, uh, to figure out a winner. And boy, we really want to have a complete uh, voting system to attack. So people can attack the network, they can attack the physical machines, they can go after the databases. This is the mind-boggling part. Just like this is the first time this has really been done with no NDAs, there's never been a test of a complete system. This is mind-boggling. Uh, Harry can probably tell you 10 different inside baseball stories why that's been. Um, but so I would love to be able to comp create any kind of a complete system. Um, it doesn't have to be the most up-to-date complete system, but that's what we're aiming for. We want to have a complete end-to-end -end system so it's just one less thing people can argue about because we can say, see, look, we did it here too. So everything from the voter walking in to check in at the e-poll right, book. Right, the poll book to the database, how you register the vote. Maybe like the DEF CON attendees who want to play, they register online, so they're in the database. Um, and then we keep the database online just like a, a county would. And then maybe people attack that before the show. And then we'd have the poll books and we'd have the voting and the tabulation and everything. Um, and so we're going to definitely, with the success from this year, we're going we're to try to invite some of the manufacturers um, to see do they want to help us out, do they want to provide any best practices, but really there's just been crickets uh, in that area. I think probably because this is the first scrutiny the manufacturers have ever had and they're really not quite sure what to do. And that's a pretty routine response. We saw that from the medical device world, car world, access control, ATMs. When these industries first come into contact with hackers <laughs> and people who are giving an honest opinion of their technology, they they, they pull back and hide for a while. But once they figure out you're not going away. Yeah, I mean, we're not going away and we're just going to tell you what we find. If you do a good job, we're going to tell you that's awesome. And if you're doing a poor job, we're going to say, hey, please fix that. And the best part is it's free. I mean, you're getting some of the <coughs> world's best hackers doing pro bono work, giving away reports for free. Normally, these people are thousands and thousands of dollars a day. And they're just doing it because they want to see what's possible. So I tell them, Take advantage of this free resource. Learn what you can. Okay, so before no, we, we Harry's got let me just a oh, second just, just uh, to here. Jeff. Uh, I think this is worth a little bit repeating. In the studies which have been made by Secretary of State uh, Ohio, California, none of those really have had end-to-end -end everything. Not the infrastructure. It, they have been concentrating the voting machines. But even if you look at the voting machines, in DEF CON Village, we look certain parts of the voting machine which we hadn't looked in those studies. So this kind of comprehensive, this is the election office, let's take a look from the attacker's perspective how to do it. That has not been done ever. In 15 years? Yeah. Well, <laughs> more longer than that. Yeah. The other thing which I want to point out, that while we are concentrating here, what is in the US? 
uh, Maggie and I, we just get back from uh, Echo Party. It's Electric Knockout. It is the DEF CON of Latin America in Buenos Aires. The same problems we are talking here are right now in Brazil, right now in Argentina. This is an international problem. And we have a different flavors of democracy, but we have a similar problems with electronic voting. So this is really an international movement. That is a great segue to our next speaker, uh, General Doug Luke. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, first to Fred Kemp and the Atlantic Council uh, for hosting us today. And it strikes me, Fred, that you've done um, an extraordinary thing. <laughs> you've brought together two communities that reside here in the country, but especially in Washington, that don't usually meet for lunch. Uh, these, are the, uh, these are the technical experts, the hacker communities, sometimes you can tell by our dress, uh, and, the, and the diplomatic national security community. And we've got you all in the same room, which is really important because that merger of these two communities really highlights uh, my main point today. And that is that the technical vulnerabilities that were just described uh, really, I think, given the 2016 experience, uh, raise this to a national security uh, issue. In fact, in my over 40 years of working on national security issues, uh, I don't believe I've seen a more, a more severe threat to American national security than the uh, election hacking experience of 2016. Now, that may sound extreme, but when you consider the, the fundamental connection which could have been compromised and may have been compromised last year. And this is the fundamental democratic connection between the individual voter and the results of the election. If you can compromise that, you don't need to attack America with planes and ships and, and uh, tanks. Uh, you can undermine democracy from the inside. And I think that's really, uh, that's really the nature of this, this, this uh, threat. Uh, today's session is not about the forensics of the 2016 elections. Uh, I have confidence, I think we as Americans should have confidence that the multiple investigations that are underway will reveal to us the full impact of what happened in 2016. Um, the forensics here will come out. Uh, but we do know this much. We know that Russia tried to influence the election outcome last year in the favor of one candidate. And we know at a minimum, they tried to discredit the outcome by casting doubt on its legitimacy. That's enough to get started, okay? Why is this so serious? I mean, one of the questions here that uh, Sherry asked was, so who cares? Who, who would want to do this to us? Well, we have at least one answer uh, based on the 2016 experience, and that is of Vladimir Putin's uh, Russia. Um, let me make five quick points about why the 2016 experience is worth paying attention to. First of all, this is a national security issue because Putin has already demonstrated successfully that he can do this. In military terms, a threat is the combination of a capability and the intent to use it, right? Well, <laughs> that's the end of that statement. He has the capability and he did use it. Uh, so we have both capability and intent here. He influenced our political process. He cast doubt on our democracy, and frankly, look at Washington today. He added to the gridlock, the political gridlock in Washington to him, and Washington today, all at very low cost to him. In military terms, this is a classic definition of a threat. We would never accept, we would never accept this level of vulnerability in any of our traditional national security systems. Think about the military command and control system. We would never accept this, right? The targeting system, our intelligence systems, our weapons control systems, the systems that control our nuclear weapons, right? We would never accept the kind of vulnerability that uh, was exposed at uh, DEF CON this year. So we've got work to do. The second reason that this is a national security issue is that Russia is not going away. This wasn't a one-shot deal where they maybe tried something and they're on to you know, the next target. Uh, Vladimir Putin can be in office at least until 2029, and even when he's replaced someday, any successor Russian leader would likely be attracted to similar tactics to inflame Russian nationalism and to weaken his international opponents at such low cost. So they're on to a tactic here that I think will stick. Russia learned a lot from what I think were a series of probing attacks in 2016. 
My guess is they were somewhat surprised at what they learned. Um, much like uh, some, of the, uh, some of the participants at DEF CON. They were somewhat surprised at how out of date the technology is and how vulnerable uh, it is. I think we should expect that the next attacks will be more targeted and even more sophisticated. So the Russian threat is real. It's here to stay even beyond Putin. Third, this is a national security issue because others watched. Others were observing what happened in 2016. If Russia can attack our elections, so can others. Think about Iran, North Korea, the so-called Islamic State, and others. Fourth, this is a national security issue because time is short. The 2018 and 2020 national elections are really just around the corner. I mean, 2018 elections are 13 months out. And we're disclosing today, by way of the findings of the DEF CON report, just how vulnerable these systems are. And we've got essentially 13 months to harden uh, our democracy, uh, harden the process. And finally, this is a national security issue because other democracies are vulnerable too. The panel mentioned democracies elsewhere, but democracies in Europe, democracies in uh, South America are also vulnerable. And these same democracies make up our, uh, our community of our closest allies and our closest international partners. So this isn't an America only a vulnerability. Uh, we know for sure that Russia has attempted to penetrate and corrupt other electoral systems. Think about the French elections uh, in the spring, but long before that, the elections in Ukraine, uh, processes in Georgia, uh, major attacks on the Baltic states, and so forth. So for these reasons, all these reasons, the security of the, uh, the U.S. election process should be a top national security issue. Now look, I'm not the expert here on the process and the voting and the machines and the hardware and the software. That's not who I, we have those experts here. That's not me. The good news is though, that with these experts assembled, we pretty much know what we have to do. Um, and we've got to get that, that uh, set of best practices that John Gilligan mentioned out to where the rubber meets the road in our voting process. And that is literally not only to the 50 states in the union, but also thousands of voting jurisdictions across those states. So we've got a lot to do in a short period of time. We agree and we commit to you today that this group, this informal coalition, will convene and within two months come back to this community, this joined community, with best practices. This has to be a nonpartisan, bipartisan effort. This is not about party politics. This is about our mm -hmm. fundamental rights as American citizens and about the health of our American democracies. Look, for over 40 years, as a military officer or as a diplomat, uh, I didn't question the sanctity, the validity of my vote. Like many in the military and State Department communities, the intelligence community, we often voted by paper ballot because we voted by absentee ballot. Remember? And I think you see a lot of heads shaking in the room here. You know, you complete your ballot, you sign the back of the envelope, you mail that thing in. And frankly, for 40 some years, that was enough for me. I believe that I've done my civic duty and I had confidence that that vote was going to count. Over the last 12 months, given the experience of 2016, I don't feel that way anymore. And I just challenge all of us to think seriously about the challenges that we now know took place that uh, were attempts to compromise and, and, and uh, corrupt our fundamental rights as voting citizens. So look, it's time to get this fixed. We've got to secure our voting system as a national security priority. And this report, this report is the first start. So let me turn back to Jake. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, General Liu. Um, so we're going to open up for questions. I want to um, highlight three points uh, that the panelists and speakers made here that I just want to make sure everybody uh, takes home with them. Uh, as as uh, Doug's uh, wife likes to say, uh, whenever I go to an event, I want to either learn, know, or do something uh, coming out of it. And so here's the three things you can either learn, know, or do coming out of this. Number one is um, there were dozens of successful attacks into the machines. Uh, they're all outlined in the report, or most of them are outlined in the report. Um, the one that, that we really want to highlight 
that came out of a lot of research that was done on these machines after DEF CON was that with parts made all over the world and software made all over the world, and as Sherry said, there's only three or four manufacturers. Um, the, the one core point that kind of election security experts and others have been making about why our votes are safe was that the decentralized nature of our uh, voting systems, um, the thousands and thousands of, of uh, voting offices around the country that administer the election is what kept us safe because Russians would need to have tens of thousands of operatives go get physical access to machines to actually um, um, infiltrate the election. We now know that's false and that through a handful of simple attacks um, into manufacturers not in the United States, um, the Russians could plant malware into um, thousands of machines all at once and hack the entire U.S. election without ever leaving the Kremlin. Uh, that's uh, pretty important finding, number one. Number two uh, is, I think, what Jeff said, which is that, uh, especially if you're an election official, uh, the thing you can do coming out of this is contact the folks at DEF CON and offer um, to, to uh, give out your machines, your databases, give them access to um, whatever else you want tested. And as Jeff said, this is essentially um, free testing and training for your staff. Um, and that would normally cost you millions of dollars to, to uh, uh, purchase on your own. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, um, is that the Center for Net Security is convening uh, a coalition, informal coalition of um, pretty impressive uh, folks like the Atlanta Council uh, to arrive at best practices uh, and then uh, help educate Congress um, as to why they need to, to pay for these best practices to be implemented and then um, ensure that uh, state and local governments uh, um, implement them. Uh, so with that, I want to open it up to Oh, to when questions. Is, uh, when's Harry hack on this technology? Then? Oh, at, at the end. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's Stay to keep tuned. you here. So we'll have okay. a live demonstration. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I didn't know if you were pointing to somebody else. Uh -huh. Hi, it's Susan Greenhall with Verified Voting. I want to thank you all so much for this. This is so important and so critical, and I was so privileged to be able to attend the DEF CON conference. Verified Voting also participated in some of the, the lectures, and um, it's great, and Hari has been amazing on this. Um, and I wanted to just raise um, awareness for how important this information was as it translated to states actually going to secure their voting systems. Um, as some people may know, the state of Virginia recently transitioned all of their voting equipment to paper ballots. And they did so because of some of the vulnerabilities that were dis uh, disclosed in the DEF CON conference. Um, they reached out to us and we helped get them some information, and I know Hari was in contact with them, giving them information and letting them know what was found, and they were able to go and provide that information to the State Board of Elections. This was the Department of State, and the State Board of Elections was able to take that information and understand the security vulnerabilities and then move to transition to paper ballots, which is a resilient and transparent system that can help protect us. So I wanted to thank you guys for seeing this transition into real world change. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. That's great. Fantastic. Um, Professor Alderman, do you have a question? Okay. Oop, there you go. Introduce yourself. Introduce yourself. So maybe oh, uh, sure. Um, I'm Alex Alderman. I'm a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Michigan, and uh, I've been working on the problem of securing election infrastructure for about 10 years. And I just wanted to offer a couple of reflections on this absolutely fantastic uh, set of achievements that's come out of, uh, out of DEF CON. Um, first, as, as Ambassador Lute says, this is absolutely a national security problem. And I think that's the biggest thing that has changed between when I started working in this field and today. We started in about 2007 thinking, well, it's possible that some people might tamper with a few localized election systems, but state level attacks, nation state attackers changing a national result, that sounds like science fiction. It doesn't sound like science fiction anymore. Um, the voting system, as uh, we've seen um, in many, many different studies over the past 10 years that have come out of different academic groups, um, is vulnerable throughout the technical infrastructure. The infrastructure is uh, a decade or decades out of date, 
And uh, there are all kinds of ways that attackers might uh, be able to compromise voting equipment. What the DEF CON results do, in my mind, more than anything else, is this is a, an amazing confirmation and extension of all of the different work that has shown machines to be vulnerable. And now, even in machines like the AccuVote uh, TSX here that Hari and I uh, and others have, have studied in the past, there are yet more vulnerabilities being found by studying it uh, uh, at DEF CON 2. These machines are broken to the core. Um, uh, but in terms of the solution, and I think the, uh, the best practices that uh, will be developed by this new initiative are going to be a fantastic step towards helping states uh, secure the infrastructure. But the one other component that uh, uh, is, is just so critical in this, and part of the center of a solution is, is really low tech. And that's to make sure that we're voting using paper as about 70% of the country already does, and that we're looking at enough of that paper to know whether the computer results are actually right through post-election audits. These are two simple and low-tech steps, but as uh, President Trump himself said on election day, there's something really nice about paper. You don't have to worry about hacking. And by taking these simple and low-cost steps, I, I think we can, we can really go a long way to protecting against so many different threats in this sphere. Thanks. Yes. <clears throat> um, I actually have two two questions ab about the the technical aspects of the report. Um, the supply chain problems, um, which which you've brought up, uh, beyond creating chaos in the election, can those be used in any way to target a specific election? You want to go for it? Well, first of all, the short answer is yes. Because if you have a persistent attack, then that is your universal door. And your only question is how you come, what is the common and control structure? Uh, one of the easiest thing is actually name of candidate on a ballot, because you cannot change it. You can, you can use multiple ways of communicating with a persistent attack using the infrastructure already in place. Sherry, do you want to? Uh, yeah, my comment would be um, just just assume all you could do was ca is create chaos. We know there's mm. more than that, but just to have you know a, even a little chaos, it would cause such a loss of confidence. I think in the election system that you know that would cause people to walk around and say you know is this legitimate? Mm -hmm. Was the election legitimate? And even if it really was, just the fact that people are questioning that, I think is hugely damaging to our um, national security and, and to democracy in general. So I think you really don't even have to go past creating the chaos for this to be a significant problem that we need to pay attention to. But you know? assume, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, assuming that, um, assuming that there, that uh, voting, uh, that either the companies charged with maintaining the systems or states who are maintaining the systems follow best practices, the back doors would still only be accessible via, say, a Stuxnet-y kind of USB attack. Uh, am, uh, am, am I just, just trying to get the sense of the well, extent of the... So let me, let me uh, answer two things. The first thing is that I think we have to rethink our threat model. Our threat model has been, and it's still influencing our thinking, the threat model is this honest candidate who wants to win. The threat model has not been cause chaos. Because it has not been cause chaos, people are not asking what are all the possible reasons. For example, if I would be a financial criminal and I would know that there is no result on Wednesday, there will be a stock market reaction. And if I can bet on that, I can make a huge amount of money. So there's a humongous financial opportunity mm -hmm. by just causing chaos. It's not necessarily that. And again, the other answer, uh, which is the, those machines do have a USB port. That's one thing. Other thing is the false statement, there's no wireless. For example, WinVote has wireless, but that's already decertified. Whatever is the opinion you have about uh, Jill Stein's effort to recount, one of the important pieces of information which came out in the wild 
is that there's a new generation of machine which use wireless modems connecting to Verizon and Sprint network. What could possibly go wrong? So <laughs> the, the answer here is that we really found as a community that this information is, it has been in, in a public document, it just was never disseminated because the prevalent message has been wireless is prohibited. No, it's already back in use. So you don't need to have a physical USB, you can just use wireless. Um, and that was actually my second question is, um, uh, the report only mentions the, the one machine that, or the one brand of machine that had the Wi-Fi um, remote. We're, we're hoping for another storm. Um, the cave in a room. <laughs> <laughs> but but you, you you mentioned the machines that connect to uh, Verizon and. Uh, so uh, we could you just go in, into in, a little bit more in, detail in about the that? information flow and Alex probably you want to maybe chime in to TDS uh, 200. But there's a paper ballot scanner machine where one of the features is wireless capability and that became a public. Do you want to comment on that? Um, uh, I, I can comment more generally. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Alex was uh, involved uh, more than I was. Uh, we both were involved in some capacity in that recount effort, so that's why. Uh, right, so what, what we know from studies of uh, m different machines as well as the back-end infrastructure is that there are several ways that they might be remotely attacked. One is through the supply chain, as the panelists have, have emphasized, that could be through machines when they're sold or through software updates to the machines that are delivered from the manufacturers. Another route is uh, through um, a Stuxnet-style attack, as you mentioned, before every election every single voting machine in the country has to be programmed with the design of the ballot, the races and candidates. And that programming is copied into the machine on a removable memory cord or a USB stick. Um, what we've uh, demonstrated in past studies uh, is that if you can modify that programming, you can take control of the voting machine and cause it to miscount the votes and to shift votes to whatever candidate you want. Um, that is a real danger because those uh, files that define the ballot are often created on machines that are connected to the internet. Um, let me chime in. The other thing here is that what has been discovered also is uh, that it commonly in the United States, and this is really US specific issue, is that the smaller jurisdictions use service companies to do the programming for them. And that means that the actual programming of the machine happens outside of the legal jurisdiction who is responsible for running the election, which, in my opinion, means that they have no control of their own election. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, let me just try to raise the conversation a little bit above the machines themselves, because that th this is a known vulnerability. But when you take Jeff's approach at the whole life cycle or ecosystem of the election process, there are other equally disturbing vulnerabilities. So think about the voter registration databases, for example, right? So all of the voters here in the audience, you're on some state voter registration database, which is developed, sustained, maintained, and used to validate your entry to the ballot. So if you can corrupt those databases, which are all stored on the internet, Right? by transposing two digits of your address, your street address, or changing your middle initial. Right, The voter, doing his civic duty, shows up at the Arlington fire station across the river to vote that day. The ID does not meet the database. He never gets to the ballot. So there are, when you look at this sort of, this whole life cycle of the process, this gets to Jeff's mm -hmm. point that the, this is one known vulnerability, but there are likely other vulnerabilities that are equally uh, problematic. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I, I hope the panel can comment. We, uh, uh, Alex has worked on this issue for a long time, and uh, the solution on the voting machine front is is the low tech solution, vote on paper, look at the paper. But the problem seems to be political in getting to the solutions. And you know, our NATO allies have moved to paper. The French election, they used to do internet voting for overseas and military voters, and they stopped it in face of this threat. You know, the Dutch moved to paper and then hand counted the paper in the last election and 
um, we are struggling at the national level to get a voluntary grants you know, available to states so that they can maybe switch to paper, so they can do post-election audits. If you can talk about the how to create a political climate of urgency, which just doesn't seem to be there. Well, so I think um, that's, I, I got a mic. Um, I think uh, that, that's exactly why we're trying to do this. This is exactly why we're partnering with the Atlanta Council, um, which is, you know, uh, one of the preeminent national security organizations in the country. We think that without firmly uh, positioning this as a national security, as, as the national security problem that it is, we'll never get the urgency um, that we need. And so that's exactly why we're here today and, and exactly why um, we're so excited that the Center for Net Security has agreed to kind of convene this broad group of stakeholders to, to come up with these best practices and help, help with that. Is, yeah. it sort of a, is it sort of a, I don't know, I'm gonna ask Doug that, is it sort of a lack of imagination, like going from the, going from the abstract to the concrete where you have so many things to worry about, this is one more. But now that it's arrived, uh, you have to take steps, and that's a little scary because now you have to face a new problem. There's no 40 years of nuclear deterrence thought around this. This is a new issue, um, which brings with it some risks. Um, you know, you have entrenched lobbying interests, I bet. I mean, I'm sure the manufacturers don't like being called out. I mean, who would? Nobody would. Um, so, and I'm sure some people stake their reputations and careers on buying this equipment, the budget. So there's a lot of interests involved, um, and you're going to have to pull a U-turn, and I bet that's going to be a problem. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's right. This is fundamentally a, a mental shift from um, the presumption that your vote is secure, or our votes are secure, to now, I think, a presumption that, you know, maybe they're not so secure. And that, that doesn't come overnight, but that's why events like today, that's like the DEF CON experience, events like today, this report are so important. I mean, the first step here uh, in addressing any problem <laughs> is to admit that there's different. a problem, right? And what we're trying to do is amplify that message nationally so there is a broad recognition that this is a problem, that it is a national security problem, that it is a, that it is a bipartisan or nonpartisan problem. This cuts across all party structures. And it's a problem that we in America have to wake up to. At one time we thought we were invulnerable. It turns out we're vulnerable. Yes. Harry? I think Harry had a comment. Uh, just go ahead. Okay. Uh, go, go ahead. Hi, uh, Dustin Volz with Reuters. Uh, related to the last question and on the topic of um, sort of broader, uh, more systemic vulnerabilities, uh, DHS recently notified 21 states that it believed were actually probed or targeted on some level during the election by Russian hackers. However, it's since come out that a couple states said, that's not true, what you told us was actually not our election systems, but maybe our Department of Labor or something was, was scanned or, or targeted. Uh, Wisconsin, California, uh, I think there are one or two others. Um, so I'm wondering if the issue of uh, how we run elections in, Amer in the United States the, the, on, on sort of this uh, state-federal uh, relationship, if that is con a specific vulnerability in your view that makes the United States more, uh, it makes it more difficult to address these problems because there are those tensions. And to those tensions specifically, um, DHS has said that it's trying to work more with the states. The states say they're trying to work more with the state with with DHS. However, the past couple of weeks have shown that there's still a lot of uh, tension in the room uh, when, they, when they try to discuss these ideas and try to figure out what really happened last year and move forward to 2018 and 2020. So uh, I'm curious if you have any specific recommendations about how that relationship between DHS, the federal government, and the states can be improved uh, going forward. John, do you want to comment on that? You guys thread this needle every day. Yeah, the, 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 so going forward, um, DHS, working with the states, has agreed that there will be a, a, a much more invigorated process uh, for notification and information sharing. And so they've agreed that they're going to create what's called an elections information sharing and analysis capability. Um, and, and so I think that's, and, and so the early results on that uh, collaboration and coordination I think are going to go a long way to uh, uh, resolving some of what I saw were the problems in the past. And I think that a lot of the problems in the past were, if I could describe, um, there were um, technical activities that were recognized and the technical community within different organizations were notified. Now, that happens every day. 
And so it was the tie to the elections and as Ambassador Lute pointed out, sort of, we've sort of woken to that there's a new significance now to some of these potential threat patterns. And, and I think that's what caused some of the confusion, is that at the time it was recognized there was an activity, but it was viewed as sort of a run-of-the-mill, everyday event. It was only in retrospect when it began to be uh, linked to a pattern of activity that, and then it became to, to rise to the level of saying, well, wait a minute, this is really a, a campaign that has a particular objective. And, and then I think all of the um, early communications sort of got sort of lost. And, and so I think going forward, there's been a commitment to say, all right, we, we just need to make sure we're engaging with those key sto stakeholders in state and local governments that have elections responsibility and, 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 in, and not just with the technical community. Now, hopefully that helps a little bit. Great. Um, in the back with the black book. Thank you very much, Paul Joyo, NSI. Thank you very much, DEFCON, for the work that you've done and all those that have collaborated on this. I have a historical question related to um, the uh, supply chain. I don't know the exact year, but it was roughly about eight years ago when an individual, a security a colleague of mine, came after a trip to China and informed me what he thought was Diebold election um, uh, equipment being manufactured at a location in China that abutted a PRC base. <laughs> um, and I told him to report that to the proper authorities and linked him on that. I'm wondering if anyone knows anything about that situation. I think Diebold is out of the business now. But the idea that that equipment is being manufactured um, at a country like China, um, and if any analysis, do we have any analysis of any equipment that was, let's say, doctored, uh, specifically doctored for the purpose of exercising an option if they chose to affect an election. Well, I'll, I'll we, make a comment and then Harry. Yeah. Um, so, so two things on that. One is um, when you look at technologies that are full of holes, um, it's hard to understand are the holes there intentionally um, or is it just because it's just sloppy? I mean, it's just that's, you know, it's poor quality. Um, adversaries are not dumb. They'll make sure if, if there's a number of problems that one is their back door in. And if they ever get caught, they just say, oh, well, hey, look, it's, uh, there's a lot of problems here. It's, it's hard to tell if that problem was intentionally put there to be used or not. Um, only once you get to really highly secure systems where the vulnerabilities are so few that you can really tell, like, wait a minute, that's such a sophisticated back door. Right? You could have this conversation. But at this level of technology, you know, they probably don't have to install anything specific because it's already so um, full of problems. Um, one of the th exceptions with the DMCA, though, s prohibits us from sharing. Um, so researchers got their hands on the machines. They dumped the software on a lot of these machines. But there's a prohibition for copyright uh, where you can't just publish the software dumps. Uh, you can look at them, you can analyze them, but you can't just go post them for anybody to download. So we're a little bit hampered because you pretty much have to get your own machine, dump your own software, analyze your own software, and then tell the world what you found without releasing the software. Um, but some people are doing that and they're going through the code looking for are there any signs that the so you know, binary's been tampered with or weird functions that don't make sense. Um, but it's not as easy as we would like just because you can't share it to a larger community to get a widespread analysis. Um, so and then Harry you had a really interesting find on one of the, well, the so Taiwan, yeah. Taiwan machines. So yeah, so first of all, the, uh, one of the machines, uh, which is uh, originally from Diebold, uh, it actually says manufactured from Taiwan. When you find a company, you find that their main, well, the only listed production facility is in China. So that's probably then manufactured there. But more to uh, two points, I, I second Jeff. In this area, and for the whole time I have been working this, it is almost impossible to make any kind of reasonable, educated guess whether you are looking <laughs> incompetence or malice. You want to think it's incompetence. Uh, but there are so many things where you really, in the findings, you stop and say, 
what would be the legal use for this feature? What would be the reason you would do this? The answer is always it's a test feature. Uh, also, I would like to point out, uh, by the way, just for the record, I wasn't planning to do a live demo here because of the uh, short time we had. But, so one more thing I want to point out is that hardware is the new software. Right now, we still mentally think that software is cheap and hardware is millions of dollars of development cost and production cost and whatnot. This is a whole computer made in Chen Chen. It's designed by a single guy, funded by uh, Kickstarter with 98,000 funding, which was already sold in devices, and it sold $4 each. This is a server with wireless capabilities. This is the attack computer you need. Actually, the computer, these are the Ethernet, the physical ports, the computer itself with one eighth of inch thick. This is not anymore something which is expensive. The other thing is, Electronics used to be soldering and something which you can inspect, you can understand. And it used to be <coughs> fairly reasonable for people to decap a chip and look what the chip is inside. Today, it's not anymore. Microchips are not anymore designed by humans. The microchips are designed by computers. And you actually write that chip as a form of software, uh, a description language. So it really is today, when you have a chip which you don't know who designed it, and how it has been forged, how it has been etched, who made the mask, you don't know what the chip is going to do. And a very interesting hidden features are found. Recently, we all learned from Intel to have a hidden uh, processor capability inside of the processor. Uh, recently, it was found that one of the biggest manufacturer of chips for uh, cars, they have a hidden processor inside of the processor, and nobody has an explanation where the code comes to that processor, and that processor actually controls the memory. It's a DMA. So if you control that, you, the game is over. So we are in a situation where it's really um, auditability of the machines is gone. You cannot audit the machine. You can audit the results, and I think the results matter. And really, when we look in the, in the election, there is, it's a good thing to secure the machinery, and especially when we're talking about e-poll books and, and uh, voter registration. And always, also, American election is so complex that you really cannot go hand count. You have to use technology. The key there is audit. Audit the results. Make certain that the results make sense. It makes, even if you think that absolutely certain that the result is 80-20, why not audit it? And this is something which is important. If you don't audit, you don't know what is the result. You cannot really today. In the next four years, there will be no machine where anyone in this room will say, I absolutely guarantee that's going to be honest machine doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Because you cannot make that promise. And you cannot, there's, it's unfeasible. You can make a best effort, but you cannot give a guarantee. And, and election is very important. So to the uh, to your basic question, we, we did find that there were parts made in China um, in most or all of the machines. Sherry, do you want to comment on, do, do, should we care about that? Does it matter? P putting your former nation state uh, um, hacker hat on? We absolutely should care about that. Um, <laughs> and even if we didn't care about the nation state, you know, individuals can be bought and sold, and so we should absolutely care about that. Even those that are manufactured in the US, I don't think we could be absolutely sure that they're secure. But today, the bulk of the chips are not manufactured in the US, and as Harry has already stated, it's almost impossible to audit the, to actually audit the chips. Even if you ran, you could never do them all, but even random selection, it's still, they're too complicated. They're, it's just hard to say, yes, this chip is built exactly like it was designed no. and like it was yeah. meant, and it works exactly like but it was would, supposed you to. You would want the machines manufactured by companies with long track record of secure operations, yes. Yes. secure software development life cycles, hiring good secure teams, being transparent and open, and right. all of that is lacking. And, and those are the kind of companies that we rely on for other dimensions of national security. So again, secure communications, the control of our nuclear weapons, we, we, don't, we don't just outsource this material. Right. This is done through a very strict chain of reliable suppliers. And not, that just simply does not apply today. 
to the election process. And in fact, if you look at kind of the, if you want to look at the DOD as an example, they've already started down a path by create, trying to create a secure foundry um, for, for, some, for some of the weapon systems, certainly not enough for all of them, but to actually build mm -hmm. uh, chips that are, we have more faith mm -hmm. in, in that they were that they gonna work and do the function the way that they're supposed to. Um, I think we have a question from Twitter, from the DEF CON Twitter handle. Yeah. Go ahead. So we've been live streaming this on uh, the Voting Village Twitter page, and the report is actually downloadable on defcon.org. Uh, but a uh, question from Twitter is, if securing democracy involves a federal bipartisan effort, are any of you optimistic it will be found in Congress? You said that in 140 characters? <laughs> so, so I've learned not to make such predictions, okay? but. Uh, Part of the story today, and part of the story in this report, uh, is that this is not just a state and local problem. Uh, it's not a federal government problem. It is a national security problem, uh, a national security vulnerability. And the track record at the federal level on strictly sort of eye-opening national security issues is that there is bipartisan support. So, um, and I think there's a quite a long track record, a history of coming together when the nation's at risk. And that's fundamentally what we're counting on here. Yeah, and I think we are, we're, t thanks to the Atlantic Council, um, you know, they brought a bipartisan group of uh, members of Congress to the voting village. Okay. I know uh, Representative Will Hurd, who's a Republican from Texas, um, did a Facebook Live from there. Um, from the voting village and said this is not a Democrat or a Republican issue, it's a national security issue. So, um, and by the way, Hari and I right after this are going to Homeland Security uh, to, to um, brief them on the findings of this report and they uh, obviously um, ran by Republican administration, um, have been taking this very seriously and we, we've been, at least I've been, um, very impressed with their, their response to this so far. Yeah. Hi there, Rebecca Kaplan with CBS News. I would wanted to know if the results of what you saw at DEF CON caused you to question the sort of widely accepted conclusion by now that no actual votes were tampered with during the 2016 election, even though there is admission that some of these databases with voter registration were hacked. Go ahead. Can I take right. a stab on that? Uh, back the 2007, when we did the Everest study for Secretary of State Ohio. Back then, the Secretary, Jennifer Brunner, she asked me, well, there has been never a documented incident when votes have been changed during a real election. And my answer was, please continue using these machines and that will remain to be true forever. <laughs> because these machines don't have a capability of providing you forensic evidence to see if they cannot prove they were honest, they cannot prove that they were, have been hacked, they simply don't have the fundamental basic capabilities of providing you that forensic evidence, that data. Only way you can see that that machine was hacked if the attacker wanted to be found that it was hacked. That's a sad truth. So anyone who says, I have a information one way or another, that's an opinion, that's not fact-based. Fact is, it can be done without leaving trace. And, and, and as I mentioned in my remarks, this effort represented here on the stage is not about the forensics from last year in terms of actually affecting the results. We're going to let the federal government deal with that problem. We know enough, however, at this point to be concerned enough to move forward towards best practices because at least 14 states are at least somewhat reliant still on these kinds of machines. And what we know from the DHS published report, some 20 states, there were at least probes of the registration databases in at least 20 states. Well, that's enough for us to get moving. Uh, and that's exactly what this group is going to do. All right, we're running over, so this will be the last one. All right, go ahead. Hi, uh, Joe Marks from NextGov. So for um, Jeff, but for anyone who's interested, the, is the Library of Congress works or considers that extending the DMCA exemption right now. Are there particular things you would like them to rewrite in it to give you broader 
room to maneuver? And is there any sort of concerted effort, either commenting or otherwise, to try to do that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I think in the original DMCA, there was the safe harbor provision for reverse engineering for security purposes. Um, and that was never litigated or fully clarified what was a valid security purpose. And none of the researchers wanted to be the test case um, for that. So a lot of people tiptoed around and dipped their toe in. And a lot of, I've had several friends who've been intimidated and their research shut down by DMCA threats. Uh, it's pretty common in the security conference world to have your more interesting talks pulled at the last second because the manufacturer threatens them um, with a lawsuit. Um, so I think, you know, the specific exemption was for voting, electronic voting machine technology. Um, and that was pretty clearly written. I think Matt Blaze and, and a coalition of academics were really active in, in trying to get that wording correct. That should be permanent. But that's just one issue, electronic voting. I mean, what about automobiles? What about other life safety systems? Um, they shouldn't be like, well, in two years I'm working on cars and then that one will expire and then in three years I'll do automobiles and then I'll go back to cars when that exemption starts again. It's like, no, we should have a concerted ability for the nation's researchers to search and find, without fear of being sued into oblivion, to find problems in software that all of us uh, use. And they're not trying to sell the exploits, they're trying to basically provide a public service. Um, there should be a, like a, almost like a public benefit corporation. There should be a shield for public benefit research, especially if you work with the manufacturer to get the problems fixed. Um, we don't have a regime. We don't have an act of Congress that protects us. We're, we're, we're relying on the Library of Congress. Okay, and then we'll wrap up after. So copyright laws are to protect proprietary information and trade secrets. When you design a software, usually a big part of that trade secret is the specification how the software is going to run. I would argue that in the election world, the specification is the statutes and the laws. So why we are protecting a software where, the where it is supposed to fulfill the statutes and the law from inspection if they are fulfilling the statutes and the laws. Right now, in I want to really stress, when DEF CON, we didn't have the backend system. We didn't run an election. We attacked this, the, what we had. So we attacked the system in a most fundamental level. We went to the basement and see if we can turn the lights on and off, and we found we can. The conclusion of that is we could have done a lot of things on upper layers, which is the um, actual election, but we didn't do that because we didn't have the backend system. It is for, I'm not a US citizen, I'm a European, I come from a little, little bit different culture in that way, but it, it's, it's incomprehensible for me why it's, why it's protected and why there is a barriers for inspection of if the system is fulfilling the law and protections, stopping researchers to verify that the vendors are selling what they claim to be selling. Agreed. Okay, thank you all very much. <laughs>